Many of you are probably thinking, and I know, I've been there before, we've set through a children's program, I'm ready to go home, so I, I, I am going to be cautious of my time, and if you would just uh, indulge me and indulge the word just for a minute, I believe that if you come expecting to hear something, I believe that God will do it, okay? So just, just a few moments together. Roman, or Philippians chapter 4, starting with verse 10, it says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that the last that you have renewed your con concern for me, indeed, you've been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, whenever I sent out, to, when I sent out for a Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except on, you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I'm looking for a gift, but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment, and even more, I am amply supplied. Now that I've received from Ephroditus the gifts you sent, they are a fragrance offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God, and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father, to be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for these children that has brought forth the gospel of knowing that, that, that love came down. And we anticipate uh, our love to shine forth, Lord, because you loved us first. And we just want to give you the glory that is due your name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. I want you just to know what context, context this letter was written in. Uh, this, this letter was written to a church in uh, Philippi. It's what we know just right there on the north side of, of Greece. It was the first European church to be planted. And he writes this 10 years after that he plants this church. Okay, so this church has been flourishing for 10 years. And so he writes to this particular church and he loves this church. Paul loves this church and they're flourishing and, and, it, and, and, and they're growing. And the same affection that Paul has for the Philippians, the Philippians have for Paul. It's, a fir, it's a, written in the first century. And it's a thank you. This letter, I don't know if you know this or not, but this is a thank you letter. And it's not like a thank you for the, the fruit basket whenever I was sick. Right? Thank you for the flower uh, arrangement that whenever somebody in my family died. It was not that type of thank you letter. Paul was in need. Paul was in jail. And in Rome, he was in a Roman jail. And if you find yourself in the first century in a Roman jail, in order for you to survive, you were to depend upon your family and friends to feed you. They did not feed you in a Roman jail. So they would have to actually have to send you aid. You would have to depend upon somebody. If not, you are surely going to die. And the Philippians came through with generosity and sacrificially. They sent uh, this, this guy named Epaphrodite uh, 800 miles away to this Roman jail on foot to give Paul money to help sustain him with food and water to drink. And he was on, and so uh, we, we talk about this particular thank you letter, and it's not just any thank you letter, it's almost like thank you for saving my life. And Paul in, in Philippians, he talks about these different things. I thank God every time I remember you in my prayers for always with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. 
And he says, if you, he also says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, same, same love, being in one spirit and pers- purpose. And all these great things, these, I don't know, um, if you have any memory verse that you memorized as a child or even today, does anybody have a memory verse that you know from Philippians? Raise your hand. Let me see you. You know some memory verses from Philippians, okay. Um, verse 10, what I, what I want you to, to go back here in verse 10, what he says, he says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that you... Uh, at last, you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but no opportunity to show it. It sounds like Paul is getting on these people. It's like, where have you been? But that's not what he's saying at all. What he's saying is all this time that we've been friends, all this time, and you've come through time and time again. And then verse 11, it says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. I appreciate your gift. And I'm not saying that, that, that I was in need to begin with, but I'm in, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I'm not saying that I am filled with joy because you met a particular need, but I have learned to be content. This word contentment is kind of like a foreign language to me. I don't know about you. Um, it's very difficult in our day and age to be Content. Do you know, especially in this turn, I don't know who in here has, has celebrated a Christmas with a family already? Anybody here has already had a Christmas with their family? Not yet? Okay. Whew. But it's getting close, right? And we're talking about Christmas and it's getting close. And some of you, even with me talking about Christmas getting close, is it making you anxious? Because there's presents maybe that you haven't bought yet or anything like that. Did you know that in our in the United States that 22 billion, 24, sorry, 24 billion dollars is spent in our in our country alone on imported toys. 24 billion dollars is spent during the Christmas season on imported toys. Can we, let me put this in perspective. The next 10 countries that spend in December on imported, ten, uh, import, imported toys, then combine next 10 countries spent $22 billion. Our country alone has spent more money than the next 10 on imported toys. Can you believe it? And so our culture is, is, is striving and driving upon this thing. Our whole marketing scheme, our whole economy is being driven by this one thing, discontentment. We're discontentment. We're discontented. <laughs> We're not content. And in the words of Alfred E. Newman, anybody read Mad Magazine? He says, most people don't know what they want, but they're pretty sure they don't have it. Alfred E. Newman. Uh, I never did read Mad Magazine, but I, I remember my dad having those a lot. So, And so what we're seeing here, notice how that we, we spend. Did you guys notice how that we spend? The average uh, household, if anybody can take a guess at this, how many credit cards does the average household have? Anybody take a guess? Five? No. Wait, Bailey, you're going to say five? Not ten. Higher. The average household, now I'm glad that I got that response. Oh, wow, I don't have twelve. Twelve credit cards. The average household has 12.7 credit cards per household. <laughs> so glad that I'm getting this response here. It's good, good. What it means, have have you noticed that we spend more than what we bring? If, if, hypothetically, you make $1,000 a week, we'll just say that you do, okay? That's that's stretching it, I know. But if you make $1,000 per week, you're more than likely to spend $1,200 a week. If you end up making 
$5,000 a week, you're more than likely to spend 55 or even greater. We have, it's kind of in our DNA that we spend more than what we, we earn or what we gain. It's because that we're driven upon this thing called discontentment. And whenever Paul is talking about this, he's saying this. He's saying, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it means to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty, and I've learned the secret of being content in any and every circumstances. And what he's saying here, now, there were these philosophers in the first century. They were called uh, Stoics, Stoics. And they came up, and whenever the people read this, I guarantee you, that whenever they read this for the first time, they were saying Paul was talking about the Stoics because they came up with this philosophy of how to be content with their lives. They came up with it, and this was their philosophy. There there was one of two things. If you want to know how to be content, the, the philosophy was this. One, if you want to be happy, you have to think really positive, okay? Think, they were were the first positive thinkers. If you want to be content with your life, whatever the circumstances, you are to to reach down deep inside of you because of your virtue, you are able to pull out of any circumstance something positive, and you can be content in that. They were the first positive thinkers uh, that was out there, these Stoics. And so basically what they were saying, it didn't matter what you say, you can reach down deep inside. They were these first positive thinkers. And it was like the first time that I preached. I stand up in front of a congregation and I got up there and I, I basically was tongue-tied. I did not know what to say and I said hardly anything and I went and sat down. And I went home to my parents and I was just distraught. I said, Dad, I blew the sermon. And my dad says, Kason, you've got to think positive. I said, okay, Dad, I really blew the sermon. <laughs> it was like the, the kid, you guys have heard the, 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 the song. The kid comes and goes into the, his backyard with a ball and a bat and he throws the, the ball up in the air and he swings and he misses. And he keeps on saying, I'm the greatest ball player in the world. He takes the ball, he throws it up, he swings, and he misses. He's like, okay, okay, I'm going to take this ball again. He gets ready, he throws it up, he swings, the ball hits the ground. He goes in and tells his dad, Dad, I'm the greatest pitcher in the world. (laughs) That's really positive thinking. That's one way in how to overcome discontentment. And the other thing was is that if you cannot reach down deep inside of you and think of something positive, then just kind of forget about it. Don't dwell upon it. Don't think about it. Just kind of brush it aside. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Your boyfriend breaks up with you. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. The bank is knocking at your door. They're about to take away your house. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. (laughs) Some debilitating disease comes knocking at your door. Your doctors are telling you, it, it, it... you're, you, don't know, you don't know what's happening. I tell you what's happening. You're about to die. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. And this is what the Stoics are saying, is saying that these are the things that... And so whenever these people are reading this letter, they're saying Paul's talking about, talking about the Stoics. They're talking about these guys that, that know how to be content. And what he's saying is that, that I've learned how to be content. And he, and he puts these juxtaposed positions. He, I know... What I, I'm learning to be content in the midst of a lightning storm. He says, I know what it means to be in plenty. I know what it means to be in want. 
I know whenever I've been hungry and I know whenever I've been well fed. And what I'm telling you is neither one of those, whenever I find myself in plenty and when I find myself in want, I know that those are not going to matter as far as my contentment goes. Because the reason why that he puts those side by side is because both of those, if you find yourself in any of those scenarios, whenever you find yourself in want or whenever you find yourself in plenty, you're... Your inclination is to be anxious in either one of them. If you find yourself in want, you're worrying about where your next meal comes from. You're finding out how how am I going to pay for my next meal? How am I going to provide for my family? You're anxious whenever you're in want. And whenever you have plenty, you're anxious because you're trying to figure out how do I keep it? How do I keep it together? And Paul is saying there is no freedom, there is no peace, There is no joy in that. There is no contentment in the midst of that. And in the midst of this this holiday season, whenever we've went through hope, whenever we've went through peace and we're anticipating joy, Paul is saying, I know the secret to this. It's not in stuff. And let me tell you, it's not in the things, it's not in circumstance. Circumstance can be very fickle. And what he says, this might completely flip your lid because you and I have memorized this verse since we were maybe in athletics or anything like that. Paul says, I've learned to be content. And he says this, I've learned the secret to it because I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And we memorize that and we think, well, if I'm a baseball player, I tell you what. I can do anything through him who gives me strength. I mean, I can, I, can, I can do great feats of strength because I find myself in Christ. If I find myself in a wheelchair, if I'm bound to a wheelchair, does that mean that if I'm in Christ, is Paul saying that I can get up out of that wheelchair? Is he saying that, that because that I am in Christ, I can be the best musician in the world because I find myself in Christ? Paul is not saying that. We use that as kind of our, our, our shield to say that, that we can do feats of strength. We can be superhuman because we find ourselves in, in Christ. But what Paul is actually saying is that you can find contentment in Christ because it doesn't matter what situation that you go through because you're going to find yourself in this day and age of finding trouble. You're going to find grief. You're going to be in times of loss. You're going to be time of, of, of joy and rejoicing. Shifts and change in life are going to happen. But if you find yourself in Christ, you can be content. You can find joy because through him, he gives you strength to overcome that. Amen? Let me just close on, on one story. There was these two Tims, Professor, Professor and Pastor Tim and Student Tim. Professor and Pastor Tim had this very favorite student, not because that they shared uh, names, Tim, but because he was very studious. He came and he sat at the very front row and he was very assertive with his studies. And he was very likable. He was very clean cut. And there was hardly anything that he, he did that wouldn't, uh, that wouldn't make anybody discontent with him. You could trust him. You could trust anything that he did. Tim graduated with honors, and, and uh, Tim went on to, uh, to do great things in the tech world. And it seemed like as he went into this entry-level level job, it seemed like that he was flourishing at his job. It seemed like that everything that Tim touched, that he, he was successful at, he was climbing the corporate ladder. A few years after he graduated, Dr. Tim, Professor Tim, Pastor Tim, got this phone call and it was his secretary he says uh, Pastor Tim Tim is on the line he says yeah I'll take that and so he takes it he says hey Tim so glad to hear from you what's going on Tim says I'm not doing too well I'm in this hospital and I think I've got the flu or something could you come by and pray for me So, so Pastor Tim packs up his stuff and goes there and he finds Tim and uh, by that time, the doctors had already come in and give him a se- separate set of news. It wasn't the flu. He had leukemia. Doctors told him that he had leukemia. 
very young age, very, life just set before him. So Tim prays with him, pray, t- prays with Tim, and a few weeks later, it doesn't take leukemia to take its course. He gets his, uh, Pastor Tim gets this phone call from, Tim, from Tim's mother, and she's just distraught, and she said, could you just come? And what happens a few l- weeks later? Leukemia has become victorious over Tim. Or Tim has become victorious over leukemia. Depends upon how you look at it. And Tim walks in and Tim is, Tim is kind of on his side and he is just so weak. He is frail. You can barely recognize him. And his mom is in the corner just crying because they know what the inevitable is. So Pastor Tim comes to the edge because Tim cannot even lift up his, his countenance towards Pastor Tim because he's so weak. And so he gets on the edge of his bed and he looks Tim in the eye. And he, can, and there's this, he says, hi, Tim, how, how you doing? You know, as pastors, you get into certain scenarios like that where you just do not know what to say. And so Pastor Tim was in the same scenario that I've been in multiple times that that maybe the best thing to do is not say anything at all. Tim, frail on his bed, says, you know, Tim, Pastor, I thank you for coming. He says, what I have learned in this life, life is not like a VCR. Pastor Tim just kind of just waits for a little bit and he's thinking in the back, where is he going with this? And and Tim is trying to get up enough strength to try to explain what he means by that. Uh, And Pastor Tim's like, okay, life is not like a VCR. What does that even mean? And so he's patient with Tim. He's like, okay, life is not like a VCR, Tim. Tim gathers up enough strength. He says, You can't fast forward through the bad parts. And in that moment of weakness, in the moment where it's just so bad for Tim, Tim comes shining through and gives us a glimpse of what joy. He says, I found that you cannot fast forward through the bad parts, but he says, he says this, right now in this moment, Christ is enough. And what became true for Tim, dying upon this bed with leukemia, that he couldn't fast forward through his his pain and his suffering, that whenever he was born, whenever he took his first breath, Christ was enough. Whenever he went through college and he graduated with honors, Christ was enough. Whenever he was going and climbing the corporate ladder, Christ was enough. And in the moments where he is suffering with leukemia, He's pulling out and he's saying, Christ is enough. It doesn't matter what he is going through. He is saying that Christ is enough. I don't know if that, I know that that sounds like a sad story, but I tell you what, that should give us joy. That should give us strength. It should give us encouragement today that Christ is enough. And in our memory verse today where we say that I can do all things through him who gives us strength, let me tell you, congregation that have gathered here today, that you're going to experience hard times and you're going to experience times of blessings. And a lot of times we, can, we can't see the blessings for the hard times. And let me tell you something, you can find joy and you can find strength in Jesus Christ. If you find yourself in Jesus Christ, he can give you strength and he is enough. And that is enough to celebrate with joy. Rejoice today. Rejoice, and again, I say it for Paul, who finds himself in a jail cell where where there is stench, there is cold, there is not a lot to be joyful. He says, rejoice. Again, I say, rejoice. Because if we find ourselves in Christ today, it's more than enough to be joyful we're going to close today just kind of a, another way that we've, we've always closed out our, our services on Advent is a, a moment where we light candles together. We have some candles over here around the, the, uh, the edges of our, our altars. And so uh, the lights are going to go down here in just a moment. And the pink candle... Obviously, we're wearing, a lot of us are wearing pink. Next Sunday, we're, we're going to be uh, expressing our, our sense of expectation of Christ brings love. So purple is the color, just so that you know. Um, 
We're going to play a song together, and we're going to come, and we're going to find out how contagious joy can be. Whether that you come and light your candle off of the pink candle, the joy candle, or off of each other, we're going to express our anticipation of God bringing us joy no matter what the circumstances are. And we're going to close this on a high note. And so we invite you to come along and and join us as we light candles together and express the uh, exuberation of joy together. Would you stand to your feet?